My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Can you put your hands together wherever you are? Can you thank God for keeping you alive? Can you thank God for seeing another day? What a beautiful Sunday morning it is. What a great day to be alive. What a great day. What a great opportunity to praise God, to thank God. Certainly we give God glory. We give God honor and we give God praise for God is a great God and God is greatly to be praised. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for keeping us another week, for sustaining us, God, by your grace and your mercy. God, we recognize with so much going on in the world, if it was not for you, we would not be alive. So God, we celebrate survival on today. We thank you for everyone that has overcome and survived COVID-19. We thank you for everyone who has survived cancer, heart issues, breathing problems, respiratory issues, whatever it may be. God, there are still those who are in need of prayer. And so God, we pray that you minister to them because God, we are your vessels. We, we need you like never before. Sweet Holy Spirit, move in such a mighty way that people all across this world are blessed. And God, even right now, as we prepare for the preaching moment, God, I ask that you preach to me, through me, and for me. Have thine own way, O oh God, and we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we are coming towards the tail end of our post-resurrection narratives. Time would not allow us to address each and every story, every narrative. One of my favorites that we didn't lift up was the cover-up in which the priest paid people to lie and say the disciples stole the body of Jesus. There, there's so many rich stories in the Bible. And so we thank God for the word of God. But on today, I want to address a passage that is very near and dear to my heart. A passage that I believe should be very near and dear to all of Christianity. A passage that some would say many of us have forgotten, but it is an essential part of how we are to move and have our being within the body of Christ. It is an essential guideline for how we are to operate, how we are to live, how we are to function as Christians. So if you could journey with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, and for the sake of time, I will just read verses 16 through 20. And the Bible says in the English Standard Version, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. My brothers and sisters in Christ, it's no secret for those that are familiar with this passage, you know this as the Great Commission. And I want to preach today from the thought, let's go. For those of you who have grown up in church, you're familiar with various ministries. And I have several favorites, but one of my favorites are missionaries. I love missionaries, not because of the way they dress, not because of the meals they cook when they're serving dinners. But I've loved missionaries for quite some time because of the impact they have had on the body of Christ. In 1750, a young man was born in Northern Neck, actually born on the eastern shore of Virginia by the name of George Leo. This man, born a slave by 1773, had conviction, had power, and knew the Lord as his Savior. George Lill was a slave captured and taken even further down to Georgia, but slavery didn't stop him. Slavery being in chains, being ordered by a master on a plantation did not stop the authentic word of God. George Lill went on to preach with such power that even the slave masters were impressed. and They decided to let him free. Isn't it good to know that when God has his hand upon you, 
No one can hold you down. In fact, God will speak to those that have oppressed you. God will even minister to your enemies and tell them to leave you alone. Here in the case of George Lill, George Lill was one of the first missionaries in the African-American church. For George Lill, after he became free, he didn't forget where he came from. He could have taken his freedom, gone up north, gone to another country and lived comfort comfortably. But rather, he went from plantation to plantation preaching the gospel. George Lill helped people like Andrew Bryan and, and so many others form churches like the Silver Bluff Church in South Carolina or the first African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia. George Lill was a powerful missionary because he believed everyone needed to know God. Lil preached so much that the favor of God was upon him, but eventually some people started to not like it. Some of the slave masters that wanted to keep slavery in operation, they began to give him problems and the Holy Spirit told him, that's fine, shake the dust off your feet and go to another land. Sometimes you have to just shake the dust off your feet and keep it moving. And that's what George did. George goes to Jamaica. George plants the first Baptist church of Kingston. First Baptist Church of Kingston became one of many. After that church, he planted up to 164 churches. What a powerful testimony of God's grace and true missionary ministry. But even after him, his work inspired another young man born in Virginia, born in Charles City County. A young man who went to work in Richmond, and while he was up there, at the First Baptist Church of Richmond, he heard the word preached by John Courtney, and he was saved. This man was so inspired by his grandmother and by his pastor. His grandmother was a slave captured from Africa. His grandmother's name was Mahalia. He heard a word from her, and she told him, I, I want my brothers and sisters back in our homeland to know God. So around 1821, he journeyed to Sierra Leone, while the American Colonization Society, they, they helped him. And we know so much about colonization, but this was actually a good thing. This brother, he went on to help found a, a nation we now know today as Liberia. Him and his friend Colin Teague went from tribe to tribe, from village to village, preaching the word of God. And before you knew it, the nation Liberia was formed and this man became governor of that nation. This man, if you've ever been in Richmond and hung out in an area called Carytown, that area is named after him. If you've ever gone on a missionary trip with a National Baptist Convention or with Baptist people, Baptist preachers, uh, you may have heard of the Lot Carry Foreign Missionary Organization. Yes, that is named after the man I'm talking about today, another great missionary, a man who believed God and believed that people needed to know Christ. But long before we had George Lill and Lot Carey, we had the Apostle Paul, who went from nation to nation, village to village, preaching the word of God. In fact, the Bible suggests he has at least three, if not four, missionary journeys in which people's lives, provinces were forever changed. But before we had Apostle Paul, we had Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came on a mission. He came on divine assignment to give people hope, give people joy, but most importantly, to give them life and life abundantly. And along the way, Jesus took some individuals, at least 12 young men who ended up being 11 because one betrayed him and committed suicide. And Jesus took that 11 and gave them a divine mandate. That mandate is here in Matthew chapter 28. Here we see that Jesus has called them back to Galilee. Now, some may not notice this be a big deal because he did so much ministry in Galilee. But, oh, there's some nuggets here if you dig for it. Galilee was the northern part north of Judah. And much of his ministry in the latter part of Jesus' life before the crucifixion, he was going southward. While he had been up north for quite some time, he decided to go south. But then he's coming back up north again. Here, there are some geographical connotations that can bless us. One Galilee is, was actually more resourceful. It had gr greater agricultural resources, greater farming, greater land, greater crops. And so they were in a place where things were more bountiful. Yes, they had been in Jerusalem, the city of Zion. They had been in the promised land, but now they are in a land flowing with milk and honey. See, 
God will take you to a place where things are greater. Don't worry about where you are. Trouble will not last always. But then we can also look at an experiential uh, manifestation and reasoning for this. God shows us here that God will allow you to go down, but God will pick you back up. Them going to Galilee, to the hills, to the mountains reminds us of the restorative nature of God, that God is a restorer. If God has restored you in any way, you ought to say thank you, Jesus, right there. You ought to thank God right there for how you may have been down, how you may have been sick, how you may have been out. But God picked you back up again. Isn't it good to know? That we serve a God that is in the restoring business, the lifting up business, the picking up business. God has picked some of us up in ways that we can't even explain. All you can do is say, thank God that I am still here. And so they arrive here and I like the fact that they arrive together. The 11 who at one point had been separated for various reasons. In fact, at one point, Jesus tells them to, to get the disciples. Or God tells them, get the disciples and Peter. But here, they're all together. And in times of need, in times of crisis, in times of pandemic, my brothers and sisters, we must stick together. And so they are obedient to God's command because God told them to go to Galilee and they arrive together. And when they arrive, to some surprise, they begin to do something amazing. When, when they arrive in the presence of God, they don't sit there with a sense of entitlement. When they arrive in the presence of God. They don't sit there and just fold their arms or look angry, but when they arrive, they worship. My brothers and sisters, if there's one thing we are called to do, it is to worship God. In fact, some of you have not worshiped God all week long, and I know you're not in a sanctuary, but wherever you are, you can spend some time and worship God. I love the song that says, bow down and worship him. Enter in, oh, enter in. We love God. In fact, even right now, God, we worship you. We adore you. We praise you. We magnify your name. God, we shout hallelujah. God, we give you the glory. God, we worship you. God, we give you the highest praise because God, you are so worthy. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. God, thank you for blessing us to see another day, another year. Thank you, God, for loving us when we didn't love ourselves. Thank you, God, for saving us. Thank you, God, for your grace. God, hallelujah. And we give you the glory. And here, when you can engage in worship, you can feel God like never before. When you are willing to sacrifice yourself and move yourself out of the way and worship God, you begin to experience God in a fresh and a new way. When you are willing to worship God, when you are willing to enter into his presence with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, you hear God in another way. You feel God in another way. God moves and blesses you in another way. So wherever you are, don't be ashamed to worship him. Even if you're in your bedroom, even if you're in your kitchen, don't be ashamed to worship him. No matter where you are, worship God because God is just that good. God is worthy of your worship. And so here we see they are in Galilee and they are worshiping God together as one. They came with obedience. They've, kept, they've come together and now they are bowing down. For the Greek word here is proskuneo, which means to bow down, to show reverence to God. And too many people can't worship God because they think so greatly and so highly of themselves. But you need to get over yourself and just thank God, because if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have the finances you have. You wouldn't have the health you have. You wouldn't have the life you have. You wouldn't have the children you have. The list goes on and on. No matter what you think you are, all that you have is because of God. So take time to just say thank you, God. In fact, can you comment on Facebook Live right now? Can you post a heart or a wave and say, thank you, God, for all that you've done for me? It could have been me, no food, no clothes, but thank you, Lord, for all you have done for me. And here we see that they worship, but the text says something that may seem contradictory. It says they worshiped, but some doubted. Scholars suggest two possibilities of what happened because we weren't there, we didn't witness it firsthand. Some suggest that the crowd was split. Some praised, some doubted. Some celebrated, some doubted. Some were shouting hallelujah and others were sitting. You know, sometimes it's like that in church. 
Some people are praising, shouting, and some are doubting. But I really like the second possibility. The second possibility suggests that some people had doubts, but in the midst of their doubt, in the midst of their struggle, they worship anyhow. And a true worshiper can have problems and still praise God. A true worshiper can have doubts, have, have questions. A true worshiper can have issues going on and still give God praise. If you have ever been there where you've come to church or you've come to a place and you didn't know what God was doing, you didn't know how you were going to make it, but you praise God anyhow and God brought you through. Can you give God some praise right there where you didn't know how you were going to make it, but you praised God anyhow. You didn't have what everybody else had, but you thank God anyhow. Can you give a comment and say, thank you, God, for being a true worshiper. Thank you, God, for allowing me to thank you even right now. Thank you, God, for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. True worshipers don't need some of the, the nice fixings. They don't need the nice settings. They don't need a, a loud crowd. They just love God wherever they are and no matter what they're going through. That's why David put it this way. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. If that is your testimony, type, type right now and say, yes, that's me. That's me. That is me. And so here, as they Worship in the midst of their doubt. This word we only see once prior in the, in the Gospels in the 14th chapter, the 31st verse, where Peter began to sink. And Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? We see here that doubting is dangerous. But in spite of the doubt, they worship God. The disciples were reminded of God's authority. Jesus tells them, I'm not making it up. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It reminds me of an episode I saw once of a show we love called Good Times. One time on Good Times, the mother was getting the kids straight. And JJ, with his brash self, with his bold and audacious self, he began to stick his chest out. And his mother reminded him, son, I brought you in this world and I can take you out. Likewise, God has that kind of power. God has that kind of authority. He brought you in. God can take you out. But also we praise God because God can bring you through. There is no other name, no other authority, no other power that supersedes God. That's why we sing the song, search all over, couldn't find nobody greater than God. If you know God to be great, you can type right now and say, God is greater and God is greatly to be praised. And so Jesus reminds them of his authority, but he also reminds them of his and their assignment. I'm not making it up. It's in the text. He says, all authority has been given to me. Go, therefore. <laughs> Go. Don't wait for people to come in. Don't, don't wait for visitors or guests, but Go. 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 In the Bible and in the body of Christ, it is imperative that people are sent. In Acts chapter 13, Apostle Paul was sent. In Acts chapter 8, after being scattered, many of the apostles were sent. George Lill was sent. Lot Carey were sent. These individuals all were sent. And likewise, some of you have been sitting down, but God wants you to be sent out to the uttermost parts of the world, to preach the good news, to spread the gospel. And here Jesus is telling them, go, therefore, and make disciples. Some of you may be wondering, how in the world can we make disciples? We see the process similar in many aspects of our life. For example, I'm a proud brother of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. It's one of the greatest decisions I ever made in my life. I've enjoyed it for 19 years and I look forward to many more. But one of the greatest challenges, yet one of the greatest joys, was after being initiated in 2001, bringing in another line. I've been blessed to bring in three young men, three young men who were, who are now professional business, one was a professional athlete. Uh, they have their own real estate investment groups. 
Uh, they're great husbands, great fathers, great leaders in their community. One of the dynamics and measuring rods uh, or measurements of a great man in our fraternity is how well he does in bringing someone else in. Likewise, in the body of Christ, one of the great measuring rods for a true disciple is are you discipling other people? Do you come to church just to eat, just to be fed, or do you take what you've learned to go out and teach somebody else? Do you reach back to those who are lost, who need the word of God in order to impact someone else's life? That is a sign of a true disciple. One of the best books written in the last 10, 20 years is called Forgotten Waves by Alan Hirsch. And in this book, he talks about the missional DNA the missional impulse of how we are to be true missionaries of God. He has six elements in which he references. One is that Jesus is Lord. For us to be the church, Christ must be the center. It doesn't matter who preaches, who sings, who teaches. Christ must be the center of worship. He must be the center of our mission. Christ must be the center of our joy. But after acknowledging Jesus is Lord, the second element is disciple making. Churches are to be making disciples. Rather than being keepers of the aquarium, we are to be fishers of men and women. And so I ask you, if you do not have an evangelism ministry, if you are not going out having a discipleship program, what are you doing? If we are not speaking the truth in love and going out so that others may be saved, what are we doing? Yes, it's nice to have a good time to dress up, but God has called us to reach back to one another. And make disciples. And so here Jesus tells them go and make disciples. Go. Don't just wait for them to come in but go. Believe it or not going out may be the best thing that ever happened to you. I noticed I read an article recently and I noticed a lot of businesses were doing delivery. And as I read an article I noticed one restaurant in particular that in order to survive they, they could no longer have people dying in because of the pandemic. And so to survive, to thrive, they actually started to deliver and go out to people's homes and to various locations. The business owner stated that this is the best thing that ever happened to us. If we would have stayed in, we would have died. But now that we're willing to go out and we've gone out of our comfort zone, we, we are making more money. We are experiencing new customers. We have a new new freshness. We have a, a new bounce in our appreciation for business. And, and just we are so excited about what the future holds. Likewise, in the body of Christ, if we are willing to go, God is going to do some great things. So we have to get out of our comfort zone and we have to be willing to make disciples of all nations. Yes, believe it or not, Christianity is not everywhere. Whether you look at Algeria, Niger, Japan, China, Djibouti, so many other nations, Christianity is not present. India, and the list goes on and on. But guess what? You don't have to go far because Christianity in America is on the rapid decline. You can go right up your block and find people that don't believe in Jesus. Don't look at this as an obstacle Look at this as an opportunity. We can go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Discipleship is teaching and developing people in what Alan Hirsch calls the apex. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. We have a lot of shepherds and teachers in America. But we need more apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Those who are willing to go out and share the word. Unadulterated gospel. He says... Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Before I deal with the beauty of the blessed Trinity, let's focus on that word baptizing. It is where one goes into the water. And they are reminded of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But most importantly, it is an outward profession of our faith. In the Baptist denomination, it is an ordinance. But I really want to focus on the fact that it is someone's willingness to say, I believe God. I believe that Christ was buried, Christ is risen, and Christ is coming again. We need more people to be bold in their faith. We need to be discipling people that are willing to be bold and say, yes, I believe God. 
If you are that kind of person, you can even type it in right now. I believe God. You can share it to your friends. You can send them a text message saying, I believe God. I am bold enough to say, I believe God, and I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Again, my fraternity taught me some lessons. One of them is, as a neophyte at the time, we refer to it now, it's called Younger Brother. You were always expected to wear paraphernalia, clothing representing your fraternity. If you did not wear it, how would someone know that you weren't a bruh? We've gotten to an age where some of my younger brothers are too cool for school, so they don't wear paraphernalia because they'd rather wear their skinny jeans and vans and toms or whatever else they wear. And likewise, in the body of Christ, we had a time in which everyone was proud to be a Christian. But now people want to go in hiding. Time is out and over for secret squirrel saints. We need to be bold enough to say, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. And as we do that, our boldness will be infectious, contagious. Other people will want to know about the joy you have, about the peace you have, and you can tell them it's because of the Lord. And as we baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, we're reminded of the blessed Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And as we do that, we teach them to observe all that I have commanded, all that God has commanded. Jesus told his disciples once, if you love me, obey my commandments. You're asking, well, what commandments are there to obey? Well, the first and the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the Bible is full of commandments in which you can obey. And as you continue to read the word of God and study the word of God, you get stronger in God and you become a better person. And so as we teach people the word of God, we, we can't teach our opinions. We should not be teaching CNN, but we need to teach people the word of God. And when we teach them, we teach them with love. We don't teach them fussing at them or yelling at them because that would never get through. But when we teach them with love and kindness, it goes a long way. I was reminded of this on my birthday on Friday. Thank you to everyone who sent me, who has sent me birthday wishes. I love you and I appreciate you. My children were singing happy birthday to me. And at some point, my daughter asked the question, how old are he? And she wanted to know how old I was so she could sing the song and, and celebrate the fact that I am 40 years old. But in the midst of her singing, my younger, my son Jacob, her younger brother, said he's three. No, he's two. What ensued was her trying to correct him and teach him that, no, our father is 40. But because she was so brash, because she was so bold and so loud and fussing at him, he wouldn't receive it. Likewise. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we should not be fussing at people. We should not be yelling at people, but teach them in love and they will receive it. Last but not least, and I'm through. Thank you for your patience. God promises something. These are some of the most comforting words in all of scripture. He says, and I will be with you always. I will be with you to the end of the age. Amen. We know that God is with us. And as long as God is on our side and by our side, no matter what we face, we can make it. My brothers and sisters, I know we're in the midst of a pandemic, but with God on our side, we're going to make it. No matter how dark things seem, we're going to make it. No matter how frustrated you may be, we're going to make it because God is on our side and God has a unique way of in those darkest moments, getting right there with us, being in the presence with us, delivering us, giving us strength and comforting us so that we know that we're going to make it. I'm reminded of this at the end of the night, my birthday, my kids were so excited, so worked up. They had a hard time going to sleep late that night. One of my sons, I guess in the midst of jumping up and down, they should have been in their bed sleep, but apparently one of them knocked over the nightlight. They, the kids, they currently go to sleep with the light on because it's more comforting to them. And as the light went out, he was scared. He was crying. He didn't know what to do. 
He returned to his bed because he thought that was the safest place to be, but he still was afraid of the dark. My son, who was crying and crying, his twin brother noticed his tears. He woke him up. His twin brother, who had done everything with him that day, decided to also be there with him in his darkest moment. And so the twin brother got into bed with him, and for the rest of the night, they were sound asleep. Likewise, God, in our darkest moments, sees our pain, sees our tears, hears our cries. And rather than leave you alone, he gets right in there with you. So I want you to know today, no matter what you're going through, God sees your frustration. God sees your pain. And God will not leave you alone. God will not leave you nor forsake you. So let's go, my brothers and sisters. Let's go teach. Let's go make disciples. Let's go baptize and know that God is with you. God bless you.